morning again, everybody. Uh, my name is Liesl Franz, and I'm with Tech America, which is an industry association representing the technology industry in Washington, D.C. Um, I focus specifically on cybersecurity and Internet governance, so I find uh, the IGF a sort of perfect place to be for many of the conversations that we have. And um, I, I welcome you all here today. We are focusing specifically on three key issues of cybersecurity and the merging issues and opportunities for developing countries. Um, we have a, a panel of experts that um, my co-organizer and co-moderator Hisham Ibrahim from Afrinic um, will introduce for you, but I just wanted to provide a, a quick overview of the issues we wanted to try to cover today. One is the legal and policy framework for public-private partnerships on cybersecurity. One is perspectives on network survivability and cybersecurity. And then perspectives on security threats and responses in developing countries, including capacity building efforts. Um, we'll also have a chance to talk about the cross-section of cybersecurity and freedom of expression and privacy, of course, with our, um, our experts. So um, uh, w our plan is to um, invite uh, short, uh, brief, concise um, opening remarks from each of our experts and then open it for discussion. Um, because I do think that the dialogue here at the IGF is one of its strengths and um, we certainly want encourage you to uh, engage in that discussion. Um, we do have one, for those that are just joining us now, we are trying to achieve one um, uh, remote panelist to join us. Um, so I think we're in the process of getting the technical support for achieving that. So um, if you hear some uh, dialing in, that, that will probably be her joining us. So um, be patient with us. Again, uh, let me inter turn it over to Hisham to uh, get us started. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you again and thank you all for showing up for this early session. We have a full room and, and um, as we had expected so because this is a very important topic and one of the um, most debatable and um, uh, important topics that we want to discuss. Um, let me introduce myself again. I'm Hisham Ibrahim. I'm from Afrinec. We are the regional internet registry for Africa. We serve the African community and the Indian Ocean by providing them with the internet numbers. Uh, and of course, cybersecurity is one of the main focuses that we focus on and, and are keen on having. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. We, the, um, the topic that we're talking about is cybersecurity, and especially uh, the title of the workshop is Safeguarding the Global Internet and, um, and Emerging Issues slash Opportunities for Developing Countries. However, cybersecurity is an issue for both developed and developing countries. This is why we try to have a diverse panel, and um, I'd let them introduce themselves with their respective positions and how the theme of the workshop fits into what they do on a daily basis. So I think I'll kick off with Chris, please. Would you start us off? Short introduction. short introduction and how, yeah, short introduction and how this fits into the daily. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for being here. I appreciate everyone showing up as, as you said this early hour. And uh, my name is Chris Painter. Uh, I've been involved in cyber issues to some extent for about 20 years, so I've seen the evolution of a lot of both the threats and, and the responses uh, to this issue. Uh, currently, I'm the coordinator for cyber issues uh, for the Secretary of State at the State Department. Uh, this is a new position that was created uh, just recently, about six months ago, in recognition of the importance of not only cybersecurity, but the range of cyber issues, which I'll address in a moment. Uh, I think. Um, the two things that are clear, and this is not, this doesn't require 20 years of experience to note, is the increasing dependence of all of us and all of our societies on cyberspace, uh, but also the increasing threats that we face from a whole wide range of actors, including organized criminal groups, transnational uh, organized criminal groups, uh, and, and others uh, around the world, and that, that creates real vulnerability. I, I think the other thing that's been clear over the last, really, few years is that this has become a priority not just in the U.S., but a priority uh, throughout the world, and uh, particularly, I think, becoming more of a priority in the developing world. Uh, in May of 2009, uh, I was privileged to work at the White House and, and to write 
uh, help write the cyberspace policy review, which looked at the U.S.'s uh, cybersecurity policy uh, and made some recommendations out of that. Uh, and that was followed by a speech by President Obama where he characterized uh, the, the threat that we face in cyberspace as one of the uh, greatest economic and national security threats we face as a country. And that's a pretty dramatic statement if you think about it. At first, it was a strong message to have our president give a a uh, half-hour speech about cybersecurity that just had never happened before, and second, uh, uh, I think anywhere, uh, and second, to elevate this as a real significant threat that we need to face. Uh, recently, uh, in May of this year, uh, the President released an international strategy for cyberspace. And uh, I should say that international strategy, along the lines of some of the things discussed in the panel, uh, was not just uh, done by the government, uh, we also talked to the private sector. We talked to civil liberties and privacy groups as we were, uh, we were assembling this. Uh, and it covered the full range of cyber activities, including um, uh, internet freedom, uh, the economic issues, the governance issues, cyber crime, cyber security, uh, that full range of issues, because we found that they are so interrelated. Uh, you can't really address one in a silo. Uh, cybersecurity is critically important, but you can't just look at it in isolation without looking at these other issues as well. And I think that's been seen in this last couple of days of this Internet Governance Forum. Uh, our goal in that international strategy is to uh, secure, is to create and maintain uh, a open, interoperable, secure, and reliable information and communications infrastructure. And it's important to look at those words too. Uh, open is what we, uh, we lead with, having an open system, uh, open standards, transparent, uh, allowing the free flow of information, but also secure. Uh, and those things, as I'll talk about near the end of my remarks, my short remarks, uh, are, uh, are not, I think, really in opposition. I think all of those have to be looked at together. When this was rolled out, uh, my, my boss, Secretary Clinton, uh, said that this international strategy, which also uh, lists a number of norms in cyberspace that we should try to coalesce around, um, is not, although it's a U.S. strategy, it's not meant as a uniquely U.S. strategy. It is really a call to try to build a consensus of countries around the world, of partnerships with other countries. That's really key to the way we look at this. And the strategy was laid out in three areas, uh, uh, diplomacy, defense, and development. And development is a key aspect, particularly with respect to the developing world in this area, but also uh, with respect to a lot of the rest of the world, too. One of the priorities for my new office uh, is to engage far more than we have in the past uh, with the developing world in this topic. I mean, I think you know, one of the key messages, the kind of bumper stickers you can take away from all of this is that the time is now ripe for this, that all countries, I think, are understanding the importance of the issue, this issue and how uh, transnational it is and how we really need to cooperate and work together to try to solve this issue uh, and that we don't all have necessarily all the answers that we really need to work together. Um, so as I laid out the priorities of my new group as we were working uh, around the world, uh, one key element was um, <clears throat> engaging the developing world and thinking about how we can do capacity building and that's obviously something that's difficult in this resource constrained environment for all of us, uh, but I think it's a very important thing to do. Uh, in, in that vein, <coughs> uh, back just a couple of months ago, uh, here in Nairobi, uh, my first time ever to Nairobi, and I, uh, now my second time to Nairobi, uh, we, uh, in conjunction with the government of Kenya, held a, um, uh, a um, capacity building seminar on uh, cybersecurity, cybercrime. We also talked about internet freedom and other issues during that seminar. It's again going back to this idea that these are very uh, uh, strongly linked, that we're talking about privacy, we're talking about free flow of information, we're talking about cybersecurity, they all come together. And that was a very useful three-day seminar with all of the East African countries. Uh, the African Union was there, others were there. A declaration came out of that conference. There'll be follow-up from that conference. Uh, too often when these capacity building exercises happen, there's a conference and then people go away and that's it. Uh, I think we need to do a better job of following up and making sure that there is progress in this area. And I, I thought that was an extraordinarily useful event for the, the folks who were there and also for me to, to understand what their concerns were and what some of the challenges they face are. Um, the last thing I'd like to say, and we're all going to try to keep brief, so my, my, last, <laughs> my last comment, is um, you know, one of the core things of our international strategy is we lay out their core values. Uh, we talk about cybersecurity. We talk about the need to do that. 
But we also talk about, as I said, internet freedom and the, the right for free flow of information, the right to connect, as, my, my, as Secretary Clinton has said. Uh, and that's really important. And I think it's also important to understand um, that when we look at these issues, uh, security and free flow of information and privacy can all and should all coexist. They should be mutually reinforcing. And I think that's an important part of our approach to this going forward. It's an important part as we reach out to the rest of the world to build a consensus around what the norms in cyberspace should be. Uh, I would um, commend you to all take a look at that strategy, uh, you know, to get your thoughts on it. I'm always happy to hear from people uh, throughout the world on this uh, and uh, look forward to any questions. So, yes, I'd like to introduce Susan. Also, if you could give a brief statement of uh, how cybersecurity uh, interacts with you on a day, how you interact with cybersecurity on a daily basis. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. So, um, I'm Susan Morgan and I'm Executive Director of the Global Network Initiative, um, which is a multi stakeholder initiative where we have companies, uh, human rights groups, investors, and academics working to, uh, to really focus on how to protect freedom of expression and privacy um, in the ICT sector. Um, the, the principal work that we do is we've developed a set of uh, principles and guidelines for companies to really help um, guide company decision making when they receive requests from governments um, that might lead to um, a restriction of um, information being available on the, on the internet through things like uh, censorship or web blocking and then also things like the uh, requests that government that companies receive from governments uh, to hand over information on, on their, and data about their users. So we've created a, um, as I say, a set of principles and, and guidelines really to help companies operationalize and think through uh, the potential freedom of expression and privacy um, implications of the work that they're doing. So that's from um, the technology that they're developing, the products and services that they're selling and the markets that they operate in. Um, and in terms of, uh, just to, to, answer your, to answer your question in terms of how does cybersecurity fit in, we're just about to do um, some research looking at how do you find the balance points between freedom of expression, privacy, national security and law enforcement. So we're about to, to start that research. Um, I think we've, we've heard a lot in the, certainly in the ministerial meeting um, at the beginning of the week and then, and then also yesterday in the opening session really about sort of cyber security and about, you know, the fact that um, issues are increasing, that the nature of the threats are changing and also uh, he heard a little bit about sort of what needs to be done and particularly the relationship and the, the uh, potential for cooperation between government and business. Um, and I think I'd like to just spend a few moments on uh, three points really looking at the sort of protection of uh, fundamental rights um, and freedoms, which is one of the uh, themes of the conference, and I'm hoping that my remarks will lead on nicely from, from Chris's. Um, so the first of my three points is really um, about uh, there doesn't need to be an inherent tension between the achievement and freedom of expression and privacy and, and um, the achievement of security, I think, you know, there's, there's no necessarily inherent tension between, between those two things. I think there's, you know, in terms of thinking about things from a fundamental rights perspective, um, there's a real sense that, you know, they're indivisible and that the achievement of one can help advance um, the, achievement, the achievement of others. That said, I think what's important in terms of kind of policy making is that um, the policy making around cybersecurity is done in the context of thinking about um, thinking about those fundamental rights such as such as freedom of expression. I think the second um, thing that I'd like to focus on is really the role of business. So as we all know, um, the internet is becoming more central to people's uh, social, economic and political lives. Um, and I think with that, what we're seeing is the role of private companies that run the networks and provide the services is becoming really more important. And I think, you know, putting, putting companies in the spotlight. Um, and I just um, offer a reflection that this is happening at the very time that a lot of intergovernmental institutions are really looking at the relationship between business and human rights. So, for example, the, um, the UN uh, Protect, Respect and Remedy framework uh, that's been developed over the last six years and a set of guiding principles really looking at the intersection between business and human rights and the responsibilities of business. 
Uh, these principles are now being widely adopted, for example, in the revisions to the OECD guidelines on corporate responsibility. Um, so they're now included in those, and there's also specific reference to uh, internet freedom within, within those OECD guidelines. So I think in this kind of broader context, you know, the decisions that companies are making in terms of how they engage with governments are really critically important, both, both in that kind of broader context and obviously are also uh, incredibly important for the protection of the rights of users um, around the world. And then I think finally, the, the, uh, the final point that I'd make is really about accountability and transparency. Um, so I think probably historically there hasn't been a lot of um, information in the public domain about the relationship between companies in this sector um, and, their, and their relationship with governments. And I think what we're likely to see in the coming years is a real growing sort of need for uh, both users and the broader public to understand uh, the relationships and the cooperation that, that exists between uh, governments and companies. So, thanks. Thank you, Susan, for that. Uh, Jimson, I'd like to ask you um, also to, to give a brief introduction and to tell us how cybersecurity fits within the national perspective uh, of your country and the regional perspective as well. Thank you. Um, my name is Jimson Olufuye. I'm the president of the Information Technology Industry Association of Nigeria. This is the association of uh, ICT companies in the hardware, software, services, and communication sector. I also happen to be the vice chairman for the World Information Technology and Services Alliance. I'm responsible for Sub-Saharan Africa, evangelizing ICT in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I uh, finally have the privilege of uh, being one of the five uh, business representatives in the CSTD Working Group on Improvement to IGF. Uh, if you look around this auditorium, you see that uh, it's about 75 to 85 you know, percentage of developing nation representation. And this to underscore the fact that uh, the issue of cybersecurity is very important in our region. Uh, in the face of uh, the WikiLeaks uh, attacks in this, of this network, of dark network, supposedly high, uh, security networks, there's been great concern in the developing world uh, with regard to uh, is our data, is our infrastructure safe? If we migrate to this new environment, is, are we safe? Uh, looking at the statistics in terms of uh, penetration, Africa has the lowest uh, internet penetration uh, compared to the rest of the world, it's maybe around about 6%. And uh, within Africa itself, uh, we have about 11 to 15 percent uh, penetration. And uh, so uh, we also know about the WISIS outcomes and the WISIS uh, projection for 2015, that is uh, for the, everybody to be connected, schools to be connected, hospitals to be connected, government to be connected, and services to be rolled online. So it's a great opportunity that uh, we see that is Africa to be able to develop rap rapidly, and uh, not just develop rapidly in terms of leapfrogging, but to cheetah povert in terms of, you know, uh, the, the cheetah is the fastest animal, and uh, povert, so cheetah povert beyond leapfrogging. Frog can only go this far. So, but we want to cheetah povert. So we want to really uh, catch up so rapidly, uh, but this cybersecurity is a concern. So how do we uh, uh, tackle it? And uh, we feel strongly that uh, we need to find a serious solution to the issue of uh, cyber security uh, challenges, because we know it will be in our benefit if we uh, develop faster. We have already seen the dividends all across Africa in terms of mobile penetration. We're seeing the dividend, but we need to do a lot about it. So um, I would say that it's a real uh, delight to see a lot of uh, my colleagues from developing nations here. I would like to really emphasize that perhaps this point is be worthy to take home. Uh, there's need for us to invest in cybersecurity research, uh, especially with regard to uh, how can we secure our network by the time we move our resources online. Uh, for example, Nigeria has just recognized that we need to move rapidly, create more jobs, and as such, there's a brand new ministry of communication technology, and we want to really uh, blast off seriously. So there's need for us to invest in uh, cybersecurity, contribute to the security 
of uh, uh, the internet to safeguard the data because a lot of people have asked if we put this thing online would it be safe so we have to go into the state of assurance that it's going to be safe it's going to be safe so invest heavily on cyber security research then also on sat uh, throughout africa uh, perhaps maybe one or two countries that have some form of a sat that is computer emergency response team uh, in Nigeria, we, we had a, a workshop last year to sensitize uh, stakeholders about SAT, uh, but uh, we yet to really move fast concerning it. So we need to invest in SAT centers in developing and emerging nations uh, where we are the poor links link to the global web. So uh, it's not something that should be left to developing nation alone. A developed nation needs to collaborate uh, with developing nation uh, to really do something about the weakest link in the web. And uh, the third point I will mention concerning uh, what we could do, particularly business, is to manage all these uh, challenges maybe better. For example, when you hear that uh, the United States Department, there's something that's leaked out of it, you say, what? As secure as that place, or defense department. So we need to do more of management. We need to find a way of uh, uh, damage control more effectively and uh, do more about the, the safety of the internet than about the weakness of the internet. And also increase collaboration, as Susan mentioned, uh, among stakeholders across all sectors. Uh, in developing nations, I've seen, uh, using Nigeria as a case study, there isn't much collaboration between the private sector and the public sector. So there is need for us in the developing nation to really uh, come to a table, same table, and to discuss this issue, collaboration, especially that uh, it's the private sector that has the greatest investment even uh, in, the, in the infrastructure. And uh, also concerning uh, law, uh, most developing nations, they do not have a cyber security law. Uh, we, there's need for that to be in place for business to invest, you know, in the infrastructure, more in infrastructure. Uh, perhaps the reason concern, uh, with regard to this perhaps because of low capacity. There's uh, low capacity in terms of know-how uh, about the issues right, concerning cyber security. Uh, I know this because of my interaction with uh, officials. In fact, most parliamentarians, they don't know what we're talking about. They're even just, just trying to grab up with, uh, grapple with uh, uh, having email number <laughs> but email address is not email number you know so it, it, it's more like capacity we need to build capacity you know in the area of uh, uh, cyber security law in the developing nation and uh, also uh, on IGF on IG awareness internet governance awareness uh, again I'm happy that there is a large and huge turnout we got to participation from uh, developing nations on IG, IG, IGF, in IGF. So we need to do more. We need to involve more. And on this note, I would like to congratulate again uh, our colleagues, our brother in Kenya, for putting up a beautiful uh, event uh, to, together. So uh, we need to involve more, be involved more in the IGF, uh, awareness and participation. And also, government will need, need to uh, increase inter, intra government collaboration intra government collaboration uh, the government within itself need to collaborate more in, with regard to uh, sharing resources and uh, putting up common defense against uh, cyber uh, threats uh, as i said uh, the the parliaments they have uh, low understanding of the issue so we need to uh, get our parliamentarians involved strongly uh, I, I made some efforts to get some of our parliamentarians to be here, uh, but you know they're still trying to get uh, settled down, and so there has been challenges in getting them up here. Uh, but uh, our brethren from developing nations, uh, we need to take this message home. We need to uh, begin to uh, bring in the parliamentarians because they are the ones that will bring about the law and uh, enact the appropriate law. Then finally, there is need for uh, cyber security tax uh, forces in our nations. Uh, we need to have cyber security tax forces across states, across uh, region, uh, so that we can increase uh, understanding and collaboration and the ability to control threats. Threats will always happen. On the real life, you can't say because there are robbers in this area, then you will not leave. 
So you have to find a way to tackle the, the menace. So the same thing on the space, that's what we tell them. Like uh, on the cyberspace, it's like the real world where you have some people that don't like the way we are. Uh, uh, so we need to come together, uh, just as we have come together, to find common uh, solution to the challenge. Uh, we, had, we I listened to the ministerial and the opening session yesterday, and I was quite pleased with um, a lot of efforts uh, that's being made concerning the DNS security and also other forms of security, and the need to uh, build confidence on the internet. So when we build the confidence, that is when we can really uh, cheat up what we can really experience what we desire according to the WISIS 2015 action lines, and then we can, by 2015, have the whole Africa fully connected and uh, being in the dream we desire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shimshan. Uh, Bert, I think once you introduce your affiliation, people will know uh, the answer to my question, but how much time does cybersecurity take of your daily process? Well, th th thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. My name is Bert Kaliski. I work for VeriSign. We're an internet infrastructure provider. Uh, and clearly, as a provider of um, a registry and network performance services, we think continually about the threats against uh, the services that we provide as part of the global internet infrastructure that we support. Uh, threats happen continually, uh, and they occur both at an internet level uh, and uh, in our more conventional lives. And um, I think about my uh, journey here, and many of you have traveled various distances, uh, the number of security checks that I went through. So uh, I, I think I've lost track of how many times I've presented credentials, passports, visas, uh, boarding passes, uh, registration forms upon entering this uh, wonderful complex, badges as we come in, um, having bags checked and going through security and so forth. Um, and maybe that's the case where we're looking uh, at the leapfrog type of activities. I'm very inspired by our previous speakers uh, comment about uh, the cheetah pole vault. I will take that back as an analogy to work for it, because when we're thinking of internet governance and the threats and the countermeasures, we need to think uh, at a different level. Um, in contrast to my experience of multiple physical security checks and the things that many of us have had uh, in our journeys from place to place, uh, when I went online, uh, I used the wireless network that was provided here uh, at, at IGF, and I suppose there was some initial check. I don't know that there's a, necessarily a password at that point. Uh, my mobile device could authenticate itself then to uh, the computer network at my company to be able to access email, and each of us may have done that in a different way. Uh, in that sense, uh, I've moved from the physical world to the cloud if you will. We could call it a virtual world, a logical experience, but let's use cloud because that's the popular term at this point. And in the cloud, we are looking uh, at the cheetah pole vaults. It's a different kind of environment. Uh, the threats that uh, we encounter come from all over the world, but so do the countermeasures to those threats. And what is uh, encouraging to consider as we build this connected digital world uh, is that even though attackers are everywhere, so are the defenders. And the defenders against those attacks can be in any country. Those defenders can be the thought leaders in the developing world as well. Together, we're stronger. And by collaborating, which previous speakers have pointed to as well, uh, this transparency and this openness and so forth, we have the greatest of advantages. So I see cybersecurity as fundamentally uh, an interaction among those who want to connect, who want to do business and to bring value, to pool their resources. Just to give one example, uh, if cyber security is concerned with denial of service attacks, with large volumes of attack coming from different parts of the world to take down a particular system, the defenses can also be distributed because after all, any of the connections that are being made from the attackers against the resources are going through the cloud. And in the cloud, there is opportunity for intermediation. 
in other words, opportunity for the cloud itself to be resilient for our communications and our internet infrastructure to find other ways of absorbing that threat as it goes from all over the world to the place of attack, if that absorption is something we can do collaboratively. Thank you very much, Bert. Uh, I'd like to introduce now Ashok as well. And Ashok, if you could uh, mention in your field of expertise, how do you see a lot of uh, the presenters before you touched on the regional cooperation and the global collaboration. Do you see that in your field of expertise? Thank you, Isham. Good morning, everybody. I am from Afrinik, Ashok Radakishan. I'm the legal advisor. At the same time, I'm a barrister at law with the Mauritian Bar. I'm very thankful for having been given the opportunity to address you this morning. And I would like, first of all, to say that with my co-panelists, they have, in fact, made an overview of uh, the problem we are confronted with from different perspectives. And they are not new issues, but they are growing issues. And this is why they should be issues of the highest concern to all of us. Being from the legal background, my main uh, input is from uh, the policy making aspect and the legal making aspect. But before doing that, I would like to say that at AFRINIC, we have, uh, in fact, led certain initiatives. We have uh, two meetings every year, policy meetings, we call them. And in one of them, I think two sessions back, we started the AF Research Initiative, where we have got a group of uh, uh, experts, knowledgeable people in this security domain who are there creating this AF Research Unit. And it is a unit of, uh, where we invite all colleagues from the African continent or from other continents as well to join in so that we make search a reality. We make people understand that search need to be put into place. And this uh, Africa search universe, Africa search uni uh, initiative is something which we rely upon you to kick it forward. We're not going maybe as far as the cheetah would, but still we would wish to take it forward. And the second thing that we have been doing at uh, Afrinic also, we have because later on I'll address that issue. We have got uh, one initiative called the uh, African Government Working Group Initiative, where we try to interface with government because there are many issues which we discuss at the technical level, but when it comes to its usability aspect, we need to get policy into place, we need to get government to understand what is it that technically is happening, so that these technical advancement or improvement could be put into the mainstream use so that networks could be secured, so that best practices could be put into place, so that end users could become more confident in the use of the internet. So there are <clears throat> other initiatives at uh, AFRINIC, and during our policy meeting, we try to uh, interact with our community members. And one of the issues is the issue of cybersecurity, is the issue of cybercrime. And, uh, it is a concern which is going to be more heated all the time. As my colleague have just said, since there are people who attack, and mind you, these attackers, now they are professional attackers. They are not uh, the young kids in the dark room trying just to experience and get a kick out of it. Now it's business. Now it's profit. Now it's well-organized systems. And we need to focus on that. I don't think this is only a national issue. It is a continental issue, it is a universal issue. And I feel that one of the things that uh, governments need to focus on about the advantage of working with the government in policy making, though we are for, we advocate policy making in the field of cyber security or to curb cyber crime, I think we have to look at policy making in the field of internet and internet governance from a different perspective. One shouldn't make policies which is going to load the system in such a way that 
what we have good about the internet, it's openness, it's privacy aspect, it's, it's a, a transparent aspect, it's accessibility aspect, that we don't load it with too much legislation, we don't load it with too much uh, regulation, so that we start feeling more fearful about the law concerning internet than about the security we need to have in using it. So policy making in this context, I would advocate, it means more government opening up. I've had opportunities to embark in cons consultation process with governments. We know that where they different fields. Consultation coming from government, they are normally think that since we need to consult, we consult. So that people won't say we haven't consulted. There must be a proactive consultation with government on the one hand, and the people who run the infrastructure, the companies, the private sector, because these infrastructure most of it is in the hands of private sector, and more importantly, I believe, end users also. So this tripartite sort of effective and proactive consultation must be put into place nationally first. People come to terms with what is involved in getting a secure cyberspace. We can't say we're not going to use the internet, however risky it is, however problem prone it is. We need to find ways and means to make it a better place, a more secure place for people to, to access and work. And governments have an important role to play, but I don't think government is the only party which is going to really come to terms with the policy. The policy needs to be policies which take into stock the growing internet economy, which take into stock the growing illegal internet economy, which takes into stock also the needs of end users and uh, their sort of uh, I would rather they're not innocent use, but more or less reckless use of the internet. Maybe I'll end by telling, uh, telling you that, why is it when we drive our car, we have an insurance policy? And this insurance policy is imposed by government. If you don't have an insurance policy, it becomes a criminal offense. Why is it in the use of our machine, of our equipment, we just use it like that, allow everything in, and when we are connected to other machines in our town, in our country, in the whole world. Shouldn't government think about putting more responsibility on the end user? First of all, of course, we educate them, but then they have got in some ways to be under some sort of, I'll use the word repressive between inverted commerce. Just like we need the license to be on the road for safe use of the road, what do we put the end user on when they use the cyberspace, they use the network, because they not only they are at risk, but they risk others. And in this interconnected world, I think government needs to come together with civil society, together with the corporate sector industry to find a way how to make the end user responsible. And this sort of tripartite uh, reflection on what kind of policy we need to secure the internet at the national level, should I'll end by this, should be pursued on the international level. There's, there must be the continuum between national initiative and we go on into the international uh, forum so that there is no place where cyber criminals would find it safe to come and settle and do their business. Mind you, they do good business, they do good money. Maybe I'll answer questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask our remote moderator, has the remote panelist joined? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. So on that note, I'd like to open the floor for questions. Um, yes, please uh, just mention your name, affiliation, and if you're addressing a certain panelist with your question, please uh, mention whom. Uh, Alex Komninos from South Africa. I'm an independent researcher. I am just making a point. Um, so I'm not addressing anyone. I think that um, there tends to sometimes be a state and corporate centric focus on cybersecurity. Um, I can see we are trying to integrate civil society here and it's been mentioned a lot, so I, I congratulate that. Um, but I, I also, I, I think that, that a phrase that's important here is that um, people need to keep their own house in order when it comes to cybersecurity, and we, we really need to yeah, address it from the individual and the group level and work at it from the bottom up. Um, something that's shocked me, 
I, I really, I still, it boggles my mind. But if you registered for the IGF online, you registered over HTTP, you sent your ID number, your passport number, your home address, which then could be monitored at, at any point along where it travels on the internet. So you know, if someone is coming from a repressive regime, if someone doesn't want someone else to know they're attending the Internet Governance Forum, or, or if someone doesn't want anyone at any point in the internet to be able to, to read their, their, their home address and, and ID number, then this is a grave, grave cybersecurity fail. And yeah, I, I think that this needs to be investigated. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I think that's a interesting observation given that we are here uh, to talk about that issue particularly. I'm not sure who to take that up with, but you know, perhaps we, uh, perhaps we could do so. Um, I know we do, if we still, Jim, do we still have a question from our remote participants? Uh, yeah, but uh, oh. they had to reboot the machine, so I have to Okay, so we'll have to wait a moment. Again. Yeah. Okay, so um, uh, in the second row here in the back. Right, thanks. My name is Nenna, and I'm an ordinary user very end very end user and um, I'm impressed by the panels and the panelists seated there um, in my other life I used to be a legal person but now I'm civil society but today I'm just a user so I'm asking a user's question um, Ashok was mentioning about putting more uh, more of the responsibility on the end user and my question is Will you give responsibility to someone who has not been educated about the issue? And the other side of the question will be, how do we share responsibility across all actors in the internet security uh, uh, ecosystem? Who has the greater responsibility? Is it the government? Is it the service provider? How do we share responsibility? Thanks. Anyone like to take that first on shared responsibility? Well, maybe I can just say, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's not just, uh, I, I think every party has to have responsibility in this. And I think one of the uh, themes last year of uh, our Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which we have every year in October, and it's coming up again, um, was that cybersecurity was a shared responsibility. And, and a big part of that, is, as you say, education. I mean, I think awareness raising and education is still something we need to do a lot more work on, uh, particularly with end users, but also with, with businesses and governments, too. I mean, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. Uh, I, think it's, I think you're right. It's unfair to put responsibility on someone who has no understanding of a very complex technology at the end of the day. And so I think all of us have a role to play in both making the technology safer and educating the end user and working with ISPs and working with the companies and working with governments so that they all can take their role in this. Yes, thank you. In fact, I did in fact mention that we need to educate first and then put responsibility on the end user. But when we talk about shared responsibility, right, this is something we have been raising for some time. But unless, as I said earlier, and until nationally, in our own country, each one of us will realize that the internet infrastructure needs to be protected, not only from, uh, from the perspective of the end user, it needs to be protected by every user and every party which has an interest in be it government, be it civil society, be it the corporate sector, or people who invest. But bringing the shared responsibility in practical terms involves that nationally there is a debate on the issue. We have to be frank that on the African continent that we have got, some countries have got the laws. I'll give you one example, I won't name the country, but I just tell you, in one country they were so far-sighted they passed a legislation in 2000, but until 2010, it was never promulgated. So if we take actions and there is no practical aspect of it, no practical sort of uh, putting it into, into practice with people using it, investors using it or industry using it, there's no point. So if we talk about shared responsibility, the responsibility has got to be mapped out in some sort of a document, be it a uh, a local sort of a document with, to which all sectors are bound, 
following what I said earlier about proactive consultation where each party brings in its own interest in the matter. It's not a government thing. Neither is it a business thing. It is a thing where the responsibility not only must be shared, but the responsibility must be taken by each party to come to the end user to get to the question. Once the end user knows what sort of field he or she is in, then that end user becomes responsible with the use of his own equipment, his own machine. And if you don't do that, then you open the whole system to risk. So trade responsibility doesn't mean only educating people to tell them this is good, this is bad, this is where you should be pay attention, but there must be some form of a discussion, a forum where people come and say what is the problem, how they want to be responsible. We can't thrust responsibility, but people can, must come and find that they are responsible. In many fields, this happens. For the environment, people become responsible. It looks easier to be done there. Then my question is, why is it that we are taking so much time to become responsible in the cyberspace, where we are faced indeed with so much? And if we don't react, maybe then if we lose trust in the system, then the system is worthless. So not only responsibility, people must become so responsible as they trust the system, and the system will be so well put into place that it becomes trustworthy. Maybe I'll make, have remarks again later. Is there anyone else that would like to address the issue, the question yeah. of shared responsibility? Yes, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, enlightenment is very important, creation of awareness uh, by all stakeholders. And uh, just to uh, buttress the point of the last speaker concerning the responsibility of, of the user, in most cases, when the user has to do a transaction, uh, they say, okay, uh, click this agreement, read this agreement, and click. Many don't read. They just click, okay, go. So the responsibility is that you should read, know the contract you are going into. That's a, another angle you know, to responsibility. And then also, uh, the, it lies more, I think, with the government vis-a-vis -vis, uh, uh, law enforcement. Because the law enforcement aspect of it is very important. Uh, we know about the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime. I don't know, maybe uh, could get enlightened. I don't know the, any African countries that uh, ratified that. You know. So that kind of cross-border um, convention that could help in, uh, in, in the mitigating against cybercrime is very important. So in that regard of law enforcement, there is more responsibility the part of uh, the government, but also the business itself. We're in the business because uh, we have always taken the proactive step, coming up with solutions, coming up with new uh, innovation. So business too, we have a lot of responsibility to ensure that uh, we keep track and uh, ensure that the system is safe for all. Uh, if, if I could Bert, make a do you want to make a comment? Susan, I think you do too, and then we have a question over here. So I, I mentioned the term uh, re resilience earlier. Re resilience um, is a concept that says you can survive accidents and attacks. And while users or system managers may bear some responsibility, the system survives even if they fail to fulfill those responsibilities. Uh, a good usable system should not place too much burden on individual users. It should let users do what's natural to them. And in fact, uh, per the driver's license, if I am in my car, I should be properly qualified. When I flew here on an airplane, I didn't know, uh, have to know how to fly one. So in different cases, the different usability has different responsibilities on me. In that case, I just needed to stay in my seat. So making it easier for users will increase the benefits of the internet. Resilience says, let the system recover from the damages that might occur to any individual users so that other users can continue to do their work. Susan? So just a quick point, I think, coming back to the issue of shared responsibility, I think given the kind of complexity of the issues and the challenges, um, there's no one stakeholder group that's going to be able to solve the issue. So I think, you know, that's, to me, that's one of the reasons, one of the critical reasons why it's important to have responsibility across, across the stakeholder groups. Okay, um, let's move on to the next question over here by the window. If you could identify, do you need to get near a mic? 
Great, thank you. My name is Ben Ako. I work with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, I think that there is a social, actually two points I need to make, that there is a social and a cultural side or angle to this debate that we perhaps are not considering. And that we have all uh, thought that uh, dealing with cybercrime has to do with a legal uh, side and a, I would say a political side or angle to it. And perhaps we should begin to think about a social, in some cases also the economical angle uh, to this uh, debate. A second point I want to make is that uh, digital literacy is uh, a component of this whole process. And we have assumed that digital literacy is a capacity building issue. And uh, in, in most cases, it is not necessarily one. Um, and that it cuts across a whole and a broad sector of society right from a primary school level when we begin to talk about uh, talk to a six-year-old child about cyber crime and cyber bullying online right up to the business level when people secure their networks um, and that broad sector of society needs to understand identity privacy issues online and i think we have not been paying that attention in terms of the approaches or uh, that we uh, should be taking in dealing with cyber crime issues i'd like to know what you guys think about those two points Do you want, um, I think perhaps maybe we can take another question and then combine responses. Would that be acceptable to everyone? Um, where were, in the back of the room over there, then we had this gentleman and then this lady. So help me remember the order. <laughs> and then if we have a remote participant, I'd like to include as well. Great, thanks, Jim. But, uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Adrian Dwyer and I'm the executive director of uh, InHope. InHope is a network of internet hotlines which provide reporting facilities for members of the public to report their concerns to of content they find on the internet. Primarily, the hotlines deal with images of child sexual abuse or child pornography, but they also deal with other areas where people report whatever uh, offences or possible offences uh, they are concerned about. They provide a great tool uh, for uh, general society to report to. There are very good intermediary between law enforcement and industry. In fact, in order to be a member of the InHope Association, you have to have full support of government, law enforcement and industry because of the sort of content that they can be dealing with. And there I'm referring to child pornography. But uh, many of the hotlines, and we have a network now of 40 hotlines around the world, our first hotline here in Africa is the Film Publication Board in South Africa, which is uh, developing into a very successful hotline. Uh, but they provide, say, this reporting interface. It's very similar to something like Crime Stoppers, where people can report anonymously, and they can report their concerns of any content. Uh, in most cases, the hotlines will deal with any content uh, on the internet, and that could include uh, offences such as phishing and various um, offences that you've been talking about here and directing the reporter onto the uh, relevant authority or informing the relevant authority or relevant body of this uh, particular crime or allegation. Uh, so therefore I think what we're talking about here is uh, very good but what we need is that interface between the, the general user, the public and the industry and the law enforcement to connect the whole the whole chain and that um, is very much where the national hotlines sit uh, as a an intermediary as an interface for everybody to use that so i would i'd recommend if anybody has any interest in uh, setting up a hotline in their country uh, certainly visit their our website uh, inhope.org or uh, speak to me after the meeting. Thank you. All right, thank you for sharing that uh, example with us. Um, I think it captures the shared responsibility or at least um, uh, another word we've heard a lot about is shared empowerment, um, giving a, a, a way for users, whether of any nature, to, um, 
to take some uh, control over their own um, environment. Um, I'd like to get back to the question of um, and the dig digital literacy and perhaps the education component of that. Um, I don't know if, uh, Chris, you want to refer back to Awareness Month and perhaps some of the things that are happening in the U.S. and if others would like to add on. Yeah, so uh, first of all, on the uh, cybercrime issue generally, uh, that, you know, that is a, a core component of this, that you know, having, uh, having strong laws in place but also having trained law enforcement uh, is important. And, and uh, as uh, my co-panelists mentioned, the Budapest Convention is an important part of that. Indeed, the training session, uh, the capacity building session we did here with the East African countries, we talked a lot about that instrument and how that might work and also talked about how you cooperate internationally, how you have networks of cooperative ne uh, 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 law enforcement networks. I mean, that's important too. So all of those aspects go together. I, I also agree that it's not just a government function, however. There is, uh, you know, people, uh, businesses and individuals in society have to be aware of what is appropriate and one online and what's not, and partly having good cybercrime laws helps uh, you uh, socialize that with them, because if they know what the rules of the road are and what's acceptable and what's not, and that there are consequences if you do bad things, that helps. That, that gets, I think, that out there. So I think that's important. So it's not solely, as, as one of the questioners said, uh, a government perspective. Uh, and there are economic aspects as well, as, as he mentioned, I think. Uh, having those kind of strong laws in place like uh, like the Budapest Convention actually then helps spur economic development as well. So there is not just a security element to this, there is an economic growth element to it, which is very important. Uh, I also wanted to just comment a little bit on the, the hotlines issue. Uh, a number of countries around the world are doing that, and I think that that's, that's very important. I think that's been a development in terms of uh, helping people report uh, issues to law enforcement in the U.S., uh, there are a number of systems that operate that way so that people, even if they have smaller incidents online they're dealing with, and it's, it's you know, when they're, they're having problems that they can, often those can be aggregated into larger events where the actors are hitting many different people at once, so I think that's important. And, and I would go back to what Liesl said. I think, um, you know, one of the core foundational elements of this is having uh, better awareness in, in industry and businesses and government that, that help you understand, again, uh, why it's important to have these laws in place, why it's important to have trained law enforcement, why it's important to have uh, good international cooperation, and why it's important to enlist uh, businesses and society generally in this effort. Uh, we had a question he here, um, and then perhaps our remote participant. Okay, thank you. Please uh, go ahead. Thank you. I'm uh, Adil Aplogan. I'm the CEO of uh, of Afrinic. So I have um, a comment and a question uh, to the panel. Um, uh, one comment I will have, uh, I want to make is the, the importance of, of collaboration. And as my colleague mentioned before, we have launched two years ago this initiative of the government working group, which has two aspects. There is one more political aspect, which is government getting together and talk about um, what we do as registry. And we have the law enforcement aspect as well, where we have um, had three workshops for law enforcement agency uh, uh, in Africa, and uh, with the contribution of the FBI, uh, of course, uh, uh, where we discuss those issues about cybersecurity, about the importance of um, bringing law enforcement uh, into the debate about cybersecurity. And, and what, is, what is interesting to see is that there is a new policy being proposed by law enforcement in Africa now on how we register uh, IP address, for instance, which is for, for us a positive thing in the, in the way of translating uh, um, cybersecurity issue into concrete operational policy. The cooperation between end users, um, uh, government, industry, and law enforcement is critical. In our region, we don't see that uh, uh, much, not because we don't want, but just because the internet really is taking up now in Africa. We are seeing more and more people connected to the internet. We are seeing more and more uh, capacity in, in, in the region, which bring the real issue, right? So people start thinking about this. And, and I think there are many initiatives around uh, trying to tackle this issue from different angles. And that's where my question comes in. How do we try uh, to uh, bring all those efforts together 
so that we, ha we can have a clear picture, we can know where we are going as a region generally and, and share more experience, uh, learn from, from each other and, and try to build a framework that can make uh, the internet a safe place for, for, for us. We, we don't have to reinvent the, the wheel. We, we, we can learn from others. We can uh, adapt what has been done. There are a lot of treaty uh, in Europe, in, in, in America, which are working or are, 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 are in place. How can we apply that in, in our region? And I think that is something that I would like to uh, um, hear the panelists to, to, to talk about, how we can um, better organize ourselves in developing country to tackle this uh, um, cyber security uh, issue. Go ahead. Maybe I'll, I'll do a quick one, and then uh, maybe other people want to comment too. Um, I mean, one thing I think is important that we've learned in our country too is that it's also important to w organize within governments. So um, uh, I would say a few years ago that the various different agencies within our government probably weren't coordinated as well as they are now. And, and that's an ongoing process. And that's true of every government around the world. There's not one country I can go to where all the agencies are talking to each other and know what uh, what's going on. And this is not just a law enforcement issue, and it's not just a uh, an economic issue or, you know, it's, it's, it's really cross-cutting. So you have to have a lot of different government agencies together working with the private sector in that country, working with civil society, working with the technical experts. So part of it's within a country and then part of it's between countries. And I think regional forums uh, like the East African, uh, uh, the EAC and others are, are good to socialize these issues. Uh, you're right, you don't have to invent the wheel. There are some good things out there like the Budapest Convention that can be used uh, as a basis and are open, frankly, for, for uh, countries in Africa to be involved in. Uh, the one last thing I'd say is I think it's really good that there is this collaboration between the technical community and the government and the law enforcement community. Uh, that's become much better over the last five years. It, it used to be that the law enforcement community would look at the technical community and say, we don't really understand what those guys do. And, you know, and then the technical community would look at the law enforcement community and say they just want to break down doors and take all our servers and we don't want to deal with them. So I, I've noticed that there's a mo much better collaboration and I think that helps everyone. Thank you, Chris. Susan? So I was just going to say I'd, I'd echo the sort of creating mechanisms and using existing mechanisms where possible. I think one of the core challenges is that there's a real tension between the time it takes to create those mechanisms and create the kind of trusted relationships that enable collaboration to happen and the speed at which the technology develops. I'd love to say I had an answer to that, I don't. <laughs> but I think it's just something that we, we need to be aware of. Jimson, you wanna yes. tackle that one? Yes, uh, very uh, quickly. Um, Really, uh, Ben Ako said something the other time uh, concerning uh, the uh, social and cultural aspect to the issue, and uh, I agree with him. And uh, I think a solution to that would be like uh, developing a bottom-up e-skills framework that would also incorporate enlightenment from the cradle to the grave. Then, uh, on how do we uh, collaborate, bring all the effort together? Uh, I see a change in Nigeria, for example, uh, recently. Uh, before now, you have uh, all the uh, agencies and um, departments concerned with ICT or cyber issue in disparate areas. So now, based on advocacy, the government decided to have just one ministry to take care of all those issues. So perhaps that's the way to go. We need to cluster and we need to establish a mechanism to build discussion uh, and uh, exchange of ideas within the administration, and then bring in all the other stakeholders, technical community, the business community, the civil society, bring everybody you know, together to, uh, and, and discuss those issues. Uh, actually, in most of our nation, developing nations, I think the onus lies with the, the government to take that initiative. Because if the government does not move, things do not move. So the government needs to move, and then you find out that all the others follow. But that is what the government needs to do. The government needs to move so that others can move. Thank you. Ashok, and then we'll go to our remote participant. Yes, I would like to respond to Adele's remarks about how do we get all the individual sort of local base initiative. We try to federate them and try to bring an African perspective, if I might say so, in this respect. 
I, I think you would recall that when we started with the WISIS uh, uh, initiative 19, uh, 2003, there were in Africa different uh, sort of regional or preparatory meetings which were held. I remember there was, there was in Mali, there was in Mauritius, there was in the east uh, part of Africa, where people came together and tried to get issues on board which could be taken up to the WSIS in Geneva, eventually to Tunisia. From then on, we had what we call uh, IGF meetings, national IGF meetings, then regional IGF meetings. For example, one of the very dynamic meetings, the East African IGF, where every year there is a meeting, and these are the sort of uh, initiative which I believe can go in some way to address the point raised by Adiel in trying to get all the different sectors which are thinking, reflecting on how best we can grapple the issue. Maybe we can start re-looking at those initiatives, maybe have more local one, national one, and uh, regional one. But then for Africa, as you are aware, there's a question of funding. There's a question of getting people to come to meeting. This is one of the biggest drawbacks that Africa faces. But something has got to be thought on this line. But to finish, maybe I'll, um, I like very much the, the uh, Ben Nako's remark about the digital sort of uh, literacy. I think maybe this is one question which must go to the different ministries of education, where we have to develop a pedagogy somewhere so that people can start to learn about the nitty gritty of it right from the time people are young in school. There are many initiatives in science, in the environment, which have been done. I think on this line, we could get the people, specialists in it, to address the issue. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Um, as you might have n noticed, we have our remote panelist online. Do we or not? Do we lose her? Uh, I'm not quite sure that this just went dead. Uh, oh. But I. It was so <laughs> looking so positive. So cl oh, here we go. Okay. Okay. Um, before be before I do that, I just want to get two related questions out. Okay. And then we'll go to the panelists. I suppose, great. Can um, you s the the first one was from uh, Jan. I'm going to mispronounce it. And apologies in advance. Jan Nutze from Microsoft, directed to Chris Painter, in light of the recent Russian-China proposal at the UN for a global voluntary code of conduct for cybersecurity. What is the U.S. government Department of State position on an international instrument for cybersecurity? And then related to that, we have from the Australia National University Hub uh, to the panel in general uh, what they think the prospects of such a U.N. treaty or agreement on cybersecurity are. So with that, get, getting those out there for people to think about, why don't we go to our remote panelist and see if this works. Thank you, Jim. And I, um, I was remiss in not introducing our remote um, uh, moderator, Jim Prendergast from the Galway Strategy Group. Thank you very much, Jim, for hanging in there with us. <laughs> okay, so are we, we have Aysa Gulf from um, Turkey joining us. Nice to see you, we actually see you in the room. Can you hear us? Um, yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me all? Okay, we can't hear you, so give us one moment. Hello? We're not hearing you yet, I school, so hold on one second. Okay. While we're working on that, should we go ahead and answer the question? Why don't we, um, before we do that, why don't we take the question that I've been missing over here, and that way maybe you can get all the questions answered together um, since we're running out of time and uh, since that school is almost joining us, perhaps we can, um, can uh, wrap those together. Please go ahead and then we'll... Thank you. I'm Priscilla Hoveda from UNICEF, New York, and actually my question is also for the Department of State. So I noticed that, uh, I mean, as we all know, the, the theme of today's is uh, everything in developing countries. And my question is, so because the Department of State is here today, what it is that you have been doing regarding this in developing countries? Could you give us concrete examples of initiatives uh, done in some developing countries, whether it's African or South American or maybe Southeast Asian? I don't know, but that would be really interesting. Thank you. Could I ask each of you to, Chris, I know you've got sort of the lion's share of the uh, answers here, but um, to try to answer the three that have been put forward in one go? 
Is that all right? And briefly, as yes. Hisham is reminding me. And very briefly, uh, on the first two questions, uh, I think we've been clear that we think uh, that a global treaty on uh, cybersecurity, we're not, this is not, that's not really the approach we should be taking right now. We do have uh, the Budapest Convention dealing with cybercrime. There's a lot of issues we need to discuss and a consensus is we need to build around norms. And I'd say our approach is laid out very clearly in our international strategy, uh, where we talk about norms in cyberspace. We talk about socializing those norms, how we're going to reach uh, some global consensus on this, and that, that is a lot of things that we need to do now. We don't have consensus on a lot of those issues. Uh, I would also note that um, there is a conference that Foreign Minister Haig is having in London, which will be discussing exactly these issues. What are the norms in cyberspace? What are the things that uh, countries can start coalescing around? That's where I think the real lion's share of our work is. On, on the uh, issue of uh, some of the capacity building. I mentioned the Nairobi conference we just did two months ago. Uh, our uh, other parts of our department have done uh, a number of cybercrime and cybersecurity related work, both in the cybercrime area but also in building certs in various places. Uh, it's not just us alone because we are very uh, resource limited. Uh, USTTI, I think as you heard the other day, is developing a distance learning uh, approach on cybersecurity that will allow people uh, to more cost-effectively get training in this area. Uh, the, the Council of Europe, who I see over here in the corner, has done a lot of uh, legislative and other training uh, around the world. So there's a lot of efforts, not just by the U.S. government, but by others as well, and we're going to uh, try to step those up. I think it's important we continue to do those uh, resources, uh, uh, resources allowing. Others like to address the global question of, um, of global action? <laughs> So I think um, it just it just strikes me that from from what I see at the moment, there's a proliferation of um, sort of standards and principles and norms coming out of a whole range of um, organisations. So um, I think that's probably the the stage that we're at, and we're likely to be in that for some state for some time. I think there are um, internet essentials coming out of the EU. I think there's um, a set of principles uh, the OECD. I think there's the principles that the Council of Europe have been referred to. So I think we're at the stage where there's principles that are looking at aspects of cybersecurity, trust, internet freedom. All these things are being looked at at the moment in many, many different places, I think. Do we have um, audio? Just one moment. Do we have audio yet on? Okay, Ashok, if you want to take that. No, very briefly on the, so the global treaty initiative. I, for one, believe that since we are in a multi-stakeholder environment, which hasn't really shown that uh, it cannot cope with what is coming in terms of internet development, good or bad, I don't know how far a treaty is going to preserve the very essential nature of the Afrinic, uh, of the internet ecosystem. So I think we have to be very, very cautious about embarking on an international treaty without really taking stock of what we already have and the way we proceed in the internet ecosystem. Thank you. Bert? Uh, and if I can add, add, add a thought, the um, technology makes such a difference when you understand what problem you're trying to address. Now, the challenge we have is the problems continue to evolve as the applications of the internet grow. So starting with um, a problem statement, uh, with a user perspective, uh, and then with collaboration and innovation, uh, we're more effective at targeting those technologies, which uh, from my technical leadership perspective puts a good deal of the opportunity within technical collaborative forums, standard setting bodies and so forth, provided they're properly informed by those um, who have the needs. Thank you. Do we have another question or do we have uh, iSchool online? Uh, I think they're still working on video, but I do have a question. Okay, go ahead and then we have one in the back of the room. And Go ahead with the remote participant and then the remote okay. question. Then why don't we give us that, Jim, and we'll take the next question and perhaps they can collectively answer. Sure. This is uh, directed at all the panelists. It's from Alexander Klimberg in Vienna. Is there a common Internet infrastructure that we all share but that we also all own? In particular, are Internet protocols such as DNS, BGP, common pool resources that belong to all and need to be protected by all? Okay, and uh, there was a question in the back. 
over here. Would you like to go ahead and then we'll, uh, we'll ask our panelists to address them. Uh, it's actually not my question. It's a question from Twitter, from those following on Twitter. And the question was um, between the national, international, and global fight against cybercrime. Where, which one should we put more emphasis on? Because it appears that we, we may have global conventions, but action is still more strategic and more result yielding at national level. And one young person just said to pass the message that his life is too short to spend time reading end user licenses. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you very much for being our uh, Twitter ambassador. <laughs> um, Bert, do you want to take the first question first? Yeah, so on the question of ownership and protocols and so forth, ownership is such a complicated subject. Uh, let me not go there, but I will take the position we all have a stake in the things that we depend on so much. Uh, as the most common set of protocols for internet communications, TCP, IP, DNS, SSL, whatever they may be, Let's share that stake uh, in making these protocols better and understanding how to implement them in uh, collective improvements and so forth. And again, per my earlier point, there are well-established standard setting processes with open, transparent mechanisms uh, that uh, all can contribute to. Gibson, did you want to cover that yeah, at all? That, okay. uh, actually, you know, when I started reading uh, user manuals, when I started reading uh, contract papers, you know, I get more enlightened, better enlightened. I'm prepared, you know, to enter transactions and to negotiate. So it's what has helped me. I just, and I think it's uh, good as well for as many that could read those things. And besides, uh, when we go into contract uh, or relationship, it may be necessary to put in all the details that could safeguard our data, safeguard our our, our you know, resources you know, online that could protect us. And um, also, we could maybe at national level, uh, something like uh, data insurance that could help in uh, you know, securing the, the resources. If, it is, if the person providing the service doesn't take good care of it, doesn't do what it should do, the necessary and sufficient measures, then um, the insurance people who ask those questions could help you know, people ask those questions too for that security data. So uh, in national uh, law, to make that possible, to make the insurance, at least to bring in the insurance people into the data security uh, spectrum could, could help. And that is to buttress the point that it still comes down to the national level. Because uh, by law and by jurisdiction, is the, the national actually has uh, the, that uh, control. But the issue of IG and uh, cyber security is a cross-border uh, issue, is cross-cutting issue, and I think um, internationally we need to continue to discuss. This is a beautiful forum. Over the past five years, uh, we've had, uh, we made useful uh, the progress, and uh, we made good progress, and we need to really continue in this forum to uh, discuss the ramifications of cyber security challenges. And uh, the example of Budapest uh, Convention on Cybercrime, I think that's a good case study uh, that we, it's possible for all of us to, to work together for the common good of all. It's one world and one it's the internet. So, so very quickly on the, on the question about international versus domestic, uh, you have to have both. They're not mutually exclusive. So uh, countries have to have strong laws, strong capacity, uh, uh, trained law enforcement. Uh, they need to have that in order to actually fight this, the, this issue, these, these crimes, in order to also be effective participants in international cooperation. So uh, they go hand in glove. And so it's important to have a framework like the Budapest Convention so that countries can get their laws up to a, to a uh, consistent point. Uh, and that they have training for their law enforcement officers, but then they also have to make sure that there are parts of things like a 24-7 network where they can cooperate, that they have very close international relationships, they work with industry and ISPs and others. All of that is, is really of a piece. You can't have one without the other. So I think both are important. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think you can choose one over the other, but if you don't have the strong domestic uh, structure first, it's almost impossible to cooperate internationally. 
So on, on that note, I'd like to address a question to the crowd, and then we go probably for closing remarks. Uh, is there any, um, and especially with emphasizing on uh, emerging economies and developing countries, uh, is there any cybersecurity initiatives, either nationally or regionally, happening in your uh, where, where you live or where you reside that you would like to report on, but in a very brief reporting, one less than one minute report? I'm Bevel Wooding, uh, representing Packet Clearinghouse. I'm the Caribbean Outreach Manager for Packet Clearinghouse, and we have recently undertaken, both through, um, through our organization and through the establishment of the Caribbean Network Operators Group initiatives that have to do with um, building capacity in the area of cybersecurity. And we've also been through the Caribbean Telecommunications Union working with governments in the region to ensure that some of these issues are being brought to their attention, one, and two, that they move beyond being IT or ICT based issues and cover multiple stakeholders, including um, the legal and security services in those countries. Thank you. Thank you, Bevel. And um, I believe we are now up online with our remote participant. Is that correct? No. Oh, we are so close. <laughs> Just a we, do we have you? Can you say something? No. Nope. She She's there, but. <laughs> I'd like for her to answer the question because I know she has one. <laughs> I'm hoping we can hear her in the last couple minutes here. We do not get audio from your side. Okay. Okay, Isagul, can you hear me? Great. Is that a yes? Not? Can you nod? Perhaps if you could type a, um, a response to the question about na things that are happening nationally um, um, on cybersecurity that perhaps Jim could read for us. Okay, okay. That would be great. Can you try now, please? So close. Oh, okay. Um, um, sure, go ahead. Icicle, if you want to send in a couple sentences that we can share with the group, Jim would be happy to read it. In the meantime, I think there were a couple other people that wanted to share their examples in the back over here. Um, two people right there. Thanks. I think the African Union has a protocol right away that is being circulated on cybersecurity. In West Africa, the Economic Community of West African States also has an act that is being um, circulated among its nation states on electronic transactions in the West African region. In Cote d'Ivoire, we have a cybersecurity act in the country, and we also have a national IG initiative that is being propelled by the regulator with an elected president that goes as far as children's parliament. That is Cote d'Ivoire. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing those. Um, perhaps after the session we could get together with those that have given their um, uh, examples and provide some links that we can include in our session summary. I think that would be very helpful. Uh, one more in the back. Thank you very much. My name is Michael. I am from Nairobi, Kenya. I am from a private organization, and uh, we build on capacity. There's a new component we want to introduce in the capacity building on cybercrime, that is detection and prevention. I in the quest to do this, our problem has been to find actually people who are capable and understand the, the same area. So uh, my, my, our intervention is that uh, by next year, sometimes in March, we want to hold such kind of a training targeting the private sector because we realize that uh, the people who are likely to be affected so much by cyber crime uh, and, and the like. So my, my, my interest is from this panel that if we could get people with lots of expertise in that area, that would really definitely help us so much as we move forward towards next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Jim, do we have any um, missives from our remote panelist? No? 
we're still attempting okay. to connect. Could you try to speak, please? Could you try to speak? For two sentences each. Two sentences each? Okay. Isaac, could you try to speak? Well, I hate to, we're so close to um, accomplishing the impossible. <laughs> um, but uh, um, perhaps if we um, can't get it in before everybody leaves the room for the next session, then we can in include whatever we can in our summary report. Might I ask our panelists if they might want to give two, three sentences of closing remarks to capture um, sort of their impressions from the discussion that we've had today. Um, Jimson, do you want to start? Okay, uh, thank you, Lizzie, uh, Tech America. Uh, really, it's been a very fluid uh, uh, discussion and underscoring uh, the need uh, for action, especially within the developing nations uh, you know, last year we had an event and uh, some of our CEOs were saying they want to build infrastructure, they want to do this, they want to do that, but the absence of law and uh, law, appropriate law, cyber security law is a kind of hindrance. So I uh, want to uh, advise our colleagues from developing nations to take the issue of legislation very serious and they take that uh, message back home to their uh, government. Thank you. I think we uh, have a voice from afar. Yeah. Oh, put your headset back on. Oh, she just took it off. <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Yes. Do we have a good. We can hear you and, and we can see you. Yay. Do you mind if we just let her make a few remarks? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead and speak. But give her like five minutes or two minutes. Two minutes. And people, if you have to go to somewhere else, we won't, but we won't mind. Okay. You can go ahead and speak. You please. can go ahead. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Could we type into her to yeah to make her know that we can hear her? Okay. We can hear you. Please go ahead. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes, we can hear you.
No, but um, but we are transitioning the room, so if you just want to wrap up. We're cutting off. Is that what we're doing? Well, Isaac, we have to end the session now. Um, if you want, so unfortunately we'll um, have to uh, stop, but um, we can be in touch to, if you have any concluding remarks you want to share with me for our session report, okay? Thank you so much for hanging in with us, really. Okay. Thank you so much for hanging in with us. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for hanging in with us. And I can't believe we did it. <laughs> thanks to everybody. <laughs> no, understand, understand. Thanks, everybody, um, for hanging in with us in the cybersecurity panel. And uh, I guess the next panel in here will start at 11, if I'm not mistaken. So.